We come to you today from the backside in the rec room here at Churchill Downs, and this episode of the Ron Flatter Racing Pod at Horse Racing Nation is a little different from all the others. For one, it's not just on podcast platforms, it's also on YouTube. That means this is going to be a show and tell, and it's to talk about new technology, technology that could save the lives of racehorses. Its nerve center is a small sensing device about the size of a wallet or, or a makeup compact, and it fits into a horse's saddle cloth. It's called Stride Safe, and it was used during the spring meet both here at Churchill Downs and for the last month when the meet was transferred to Ellis Park, worn by every horse who went to the track in the morning and the afternoon. It monitors gates and strides, so if there's anything off, trainers are made aware of it within minutes. It's still a work in progress, but we got a first-hand look at it last week when we visited the barn of Dale Romans. You will hear from him today, and you will hear from two veterinarians who have been involved with the deployment of this technology here in Kentucky. David Lambert from England was one of the inventors of Stride Safe, and Denise McSweeney from Ireland is an equine surgery resident at the Washington State University campus. David and Denise have been working here in Kentucky all spring and summer so far to offer this a tour of this technology in action. Let me frame the story here. First, I should tell you, this is not a commercial. We did not get one cent for this story from Stride Safe or anyone. Dale actually invited me to check it out, and I was intrigued, so I did. Besides Stride Safe not being commercially available, it's still in the development stage, so nothing really commercially to apply here. Stride Safe was introduced in America three years ago at Emerald Downs. It was refined and tweaked for another trial period with the New York Racing Association. This year's project at Churchill was paid for with a grant from the Kentucky Horse Racing Commission. Now, whether that may be renewed for further use this year as the technology is advanced remains to be seen. It is not without its skeptics, and that was one reason for a town hall on Zoom last week that was put together by the Kentucky Horsemen's Benevolent Protective Association. As a reminder that this new science is not some magic potion, National HBPA CEO Eric Hamelback offered a two-minute introduction. Regulations are not going to eliminate risk. It is very important that everyone outside of our industry understand that. Science is not going to eliminate risks in horse racing. We can't create regulations and just expect all those risks to go away. We don't want regulations to ultimately diminish horsemanship. Quite frankly, I think that's a road that we're on. But we're here to talk about science. I think science, such as Stride State, such as the lameness locator, such as the new fracture support system that the HBPA brought over from Ireland, is important. Science is important. And we try to make sure we educate folks on what can we do better to help mitigate risks. Again, we cannot eliminate them, and we don't have enough people in our industry that are saying that. We don't have enough people that will go on TV and make sure everyone understands that horse racing has inherent risks. And no matter what we do as horsemen, as veterinarians, as racetrack ownership groups, it's not going to go away. It's going to be a problem at some point. But what can we do as horsemen? What can racetrack ownership do to help mitigate those risks? That's what we're talking about. We're not trying to talk about gotcha science. We're all in this world where things are happening that not all of us approve of. But the one thing that brings everybody in this room, it's the love of the horse. By God, I've been doing this since I was 14 years old in Louisiana Downs, and I make decisions today based off of what I think is going to be best for the horse. And if we do that, we're going to be in a better place. Not a PR, point your finger, who's at fault. We have to do what's best for the horse. 
To illustrate Hamelbach's declaration that the risks cannot be completely erased, there was a training accident just last week. An unraced two-year-old filly from the barn of Tom Amos became the 13th horse to die here at Churchill Downs since April 27th. But it also was the first confirmed death in more than a month. Was stride safe one of the reasons for that clean 33-day run? At the same time, was stride safe guilty of redboarding when it said in a news release that its technology might have saved seven of the horses who perished. We got into all that in this episode, most of which was recorded at Barn 4 here at Churchill Downs. Dale Romans, we're going to be uh, introducing folks to Stride Safe here. We're going to go right to work and do this right away, right? We're going to put this on a horse yep. and... We'll put it on a horse and we'll uh, see what its data shows. What we're trying to do with this sensor, people need to realize, is pick up a problem before the human can pick it up with their eye or a rider can feel it. And if, what we're trying to do is make things that become 60-day problems or even catastrophic injuries, reduce them into two-week problems where we need a couple weeks walking and we don't need to be out for six months. All right, so, so shall we put it in. Okay, and uh, Stride Safe is the product. And uh, as we were seeing here a few minutes ago, as we walked down the shed row, you're about to put this little sensor in a saddle cloth that you're about to put on a horse that's about to go and work out, right? Yeah, he's just going to go out and do work. It's only re it only works when you're doing speed work, so it has to be going a certain speed before it really is picking up. So basically breezes up. and strong breezes, gallops. Breezes, strong gallops, or in the races. Now, these sensors are a part of the project. These sensors are on every horse that runs at Churchill Downs. And we're seeing the uh, tack being put on the horse, and we can introduce ourselves to Denise McSweeney, who works with the Stride Safe team. And Denise, we were seeing earlier, the size of this is it's almost like it, it's a you can fit it in the palm of your hand, right? Yeah, yeah it's, it's very lightweight, very compact. Uh, the horses don't notice it, and it doesn't affect anything to do with their stride once they're galloping. And um, they're pretty simple and easy to use. We just, like I said, pop it into that saddle cloth. Tack them off and you'll head out now and we'll collect it when he comes back and plug it back in. David Lambert, who is uh, one of the guys who was inventing this, he's right there too. You can see him if you're watching on YouTube. They're putting on the tack and the stride safe saddle cloth is under the saddle. And uh, it, the sensing device fits just in a, in a small pocket, David, does it not? The yes. sensor is right there in a the pocket in the saddle cloth. Very, uh, it, you, you don't notice it. No, no. Very inconspicuous, very lightweight. And uh, so we'll bring the horse out. What's the horse's name, by the way? I'm sorry, what was the horse's name? I'm not sure. Not sure? Well, Dale will know that. It's one of their two-year-olds that's going out for one of his okay. pieces of work. So. And, and explain then, if, if you could, yeah. what the sensing device actually is measuring and is actually finding. Okay, it's, um, we're measuring accelerations, um, and so that really means force. So when something changes speed, there's a force that's made it change. Um, so by measuring acceleration, you get an indirect measurement of force. And we're doing it in three dimension, dimensions, side to side, up and down, front to back. It's doing it about 2,400 times every second. Um, and then that information is downloaded onto a SIM card in the sensor. And when we get it back after the breeze, we'll download that onto the computer and then analyze all that data. Does each horse have to have a baseline established in terms of his conformation and what is measured? Do you actually have yeah. to put it on a horse a couple times to kind of get a yeah. a, a, a standard? Yeah, and so if there's right. a deviation from that, that's when you have an alarm yeah. bell go that's, off. As uh, it were. We can do it before that. That's the idea. That's what we aim towards. But then you've got to start somewhere, right? So, but eventually, yeah, the strength of the system is when you've got multiple readings and then you can get the individual stride pattern for that animal. Uh, we call it a stride oh. fingerprint because it's very, very unique uh, to each horse. But uh, in the meantime, while we're building up that data, we're able to compare his data to 40,000 other cases that we've got in the database to get a general sense of where he is. And then we can compare it to the data from a given track uh, for a given cohort, let's say two-year-old sprinters, that kind of thing, we can compare them to that. So we get multiple ways of looking at it until we've got his own individual program worked out. How much 
research, how much background, how much initial work had to go into this before you could even start to deploy it here in Kentucky this spring? Well, we've been very lucky. Um, 2005 was the first time I put a sensor on a horse, and that was uh, trying to assess how well the horse was moving. I was trying to get a feel for what, get a measurement on what jockeys feel. Um, I've been around a lot of grade one winners and a lot of top jockeys and you know the thought crosses your mind when that jockey he's got all this all this information in his brain and in his body and when he's dead and gone that goes with him we've got to try and find some way of measuring that so that's what started it in the first place 2005 and then this particular sensor system has been in use for about 10 years in Tasmania Uh, it's a far better system than my original one but Uh, That got us 35,000 cases when we had access to that. Uh, So there was all this data just sitting there waiting when this uh, problem happened with all the fractures in in California. Um, And so we started looking at at it straight away and then COVID hit. So then we're all stuck at home with nothing to do except look at 35,000 case histories. So that gave us a good solid year of study. Uh, which then led to the product which we were able to employ first at Emerald Downs and then eventually at some of the Naira tracks and now here. What have you found in terms of the samples and how reliable it is that you, if you see something as haywire, Mm -hmm. that it is a signal that you could have something worse happening? Mm -hmm. Um, um, There's a lot of, as you can, I'm sure you can imagine, there's a lot of noise in this kind of a, a procedure, um, the, the nature of the ground, the attitude of the horse, the quality of the horse, all these kinds of things, we had to find a way to get past all that. Uh, and what we wanted to find instead were those animals which were broken, for want of a better word, something had gone wrong with the, the basic structure of the information coming from a horse and if something was broken then it would stand out on our sensors so I, I've likened it often to uh, the tyre sensor in your car so you drive down the blacktop it doesn't come on you drive across a field it doesn't come on you drive around Churchill Downs it won't come on but the moment you lose two pounds of pressure in one of the tyres bang your light comes on so it's that kind of a deal we had to be just like that that sensor in your car coming on when something wasn't right i liken it a little bit to when we around here and we live with it a lot here in kentucky tornado watches <laughs> now not all tornado watches are going to produce tornadoes but i don't think there's anyone here in kentucky who's lived here for any length of time who doesn't appreciate having that tornado watch on the just in case and so i understand that maybe for every five times that you have an alarm go off, there's really maybe just the once that there is something significant that has to be brought to the attention, but that's it's better than no notice at all, right? That's right. That's that's a good analogy. I might use that again. Please do. <laughs> I'll plagiarize that. Oh, please do. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's difficult, you know, people do react, say, well, I get a false red, or I got a red flag and there was nothing wrong with it. Um, and it can... It can put people off sometimes. So I wish everybody would take the approach you just did. It's like a like a tornado watch, and sometimes it's a false alarm, but you're sure glad once it isn't, and you're in the basement being safe. <laughs> That's right. Denise, can I call you in here? I know you're you're one of the you're kind of the data expert here in terms of distilling the information, or am I am I uh, gauging you correctly? So because it I'm seems a, like you got your hands on it a lot. Yeah, so I'm a surgery resident from Washington. Oh, okay, University. all right. Um, so I'm here basically trying to do follow ups on some of these red flag horses. And um, part of what I've been doing is running the breezing sensors here in the mornings at Churchill Downs. Okay. So typically, um, if a horse gets a red flag. We take a look at the stride pattern for that horse. We look at that horse's form. We watch that horse's race in case there's, you know, something in the race that's very obvious as to what could have caused it. Um, then I'll call the uh, trainer of that horse, inform that they have a red flag, chat to them about what that means and what our sensors are doing, um, and then basically ask that if they if they want to share any of that follow-up information with me, whether their vet goes over it and finds something and they want to report that to help us to further evaluate. Um, you know, our data and see what, what it's correlating to in a clinical exam. Um, that's the primary reason why, why I'm here and that's what I'm doing. Okay, so your surgical background brings then to mind the, the ability to see in a horse that something is wrong, in addition to 
comparing the data with it. So when you're looking at the data, I, I, I guess it's sort of like being, if you're gambling on horses, are you a horse player or a form player? It sounds like you're kind of a hybrid that you're able to see something on the on maybe that chart, there's a little line I know that shows up on a graph and you say, wait, something's haywire there, then you can look at the horse yeah. and see if that applies to the actual horse and his uh, confirmation, his, his ability to do yeah. what he does. So at, at the moment, you know, this is a screening test for horses that are at high risk of having a catastrophic injury. Um, you know, but we are aware that there are certain signals that we can see in certain patterns on the graphs that might be linked to a particular limb um, or indeed injury. So. Uh, you know, as, as a surgery resident, I'm always going to be interested in the clinical follow-up and the clinical application of something like this. So, um, again, like I said, the more follow-up we get and the more uh, information on these horses that have had the red flags, the more that we're going to be able to interpret the data further. So, for the likes of me as a veterinarian and the vets here at Churchill Downs, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we can get more detailed in our calls. So, when we call or send out an email saying that a horse has a red flag, um, you know, if we have a certain number of horses, at, you know, at the end of the day, that a certain pattern indicated whether it was a right front, left front, um, that's just something we can pass on to these vets and give them a, a spot to start looking in. Um, we also have funding here going towards advanced imaging. Um, there is a state-of-the-art PET scan unit here uh, owned by Hagrid uh, Equine Medical mm -hmm. Institute. It's here in the uh, Churchill Downs Imaging Centre. Uh, so we've put a few horses through that PET scan free of charge and that's being funded by the grant which we're on. Um, that also extends to things like uh, MRI, nuclear scintigraphy, basically anything that the trainer and the veterinarian feels appropriate to follow up with these red flags. And again, that'll give us more data and concrete information as to um, what, what, what caused this horse to get this flag. At the risk of calling it a success uh, in terms of finding injuries before they get worse, I, you know, if you find an injury, that would be a success. You never want to see an injured horse, but to find that before something catastrophic happens is certainly something you, you, you plant your flag in. Has that happened with a degree, some degree of regularity this spring, or what have you found? Have there been moments where you say, oh my goodness, it's a good thing that horse did not go any further than he did? Yes, we've certainly had those moments. Absolutely, we feel strongly that um, we have stopped horses from whether it was catastrophic or just a career-ending injury. Um, you know, we're in, improved the longevity of this horse's uh, life as a as a training racing horse so I, I feel quite strongly about that you know the reality is that with thankfully such a low rate of breakdowns you know are we saying 1.4 in a thousand we're never going to have you know several hundred breakdowns to to support a red flag thank god mm -hmm. so these things that we can prevent um that's that's where all this is going to stand David, context is everything. We heard the criticism that did come out when the statement was made that seven of eight neuromuscular uh, catastrophic injuries uh, could have been prevented had the sensing devices been in place. Context is everything, yeah. though, isn't it? So I know the other day when you had the round table mm -hmm. with Horseman and some of the media that you did try to put it into context, and I'll let you go ahead and explain that. Oh, that's great. Thank you very much, yeah. Um, I, uh, when, that, when we first put that press release out, I had my kind of scientist mind on, and I was uh, thinking of all the literature, the things that have been written about uh, catastrophic injury. And uh, in that context, uh, we've known these things have been going on for you know, 30 years. People have been uh, doing autopsies on these animals, and they've discovered along the way that about 85 to 90 percent of the horses have got some sort of disease process in the bone already, and they've termed that a pre-existing condition. Um, therein lies actually the opportunity to intervene and save these horses, because if there is some low-grade disease going on in that bone, and if it changes the way the horse moves, then that's the opportunity to spot it early and get, in, get involved and maybe rest the horse. So I use the term pre-existing condition because that's what's in the literature. Unfortunately, when that word was used to the training population, they interpreted it that I was saying there was something wrong with the horse going in and that they should have caught it and, and prevented it. And that was exactly not what I was saying. I was saying the exact opposite. Sure, there's some biological changes on this animal, 
but you can't see it. There's no heat, there's no swelling, there's no pain. So there's no way a trainer or a vet or anyone could have spotted it beforehand. So it, it got a little bit uh, messed up with that use of the term uh, pre-existing condition. The context got mm -hmm. was, was interpreted in, a, in an unfortunate way. To that extent, though, you know with science, we've seen it in other walks of life that... Mm. Some of us are faster to accept technology than others. Uh, some of us might be Luddites. But, uh, so I imagine you're dealing with that and yeah. trying to convince horsemen that, listen, I'm not trying to replace you. Yeah. We're just trying to help you. That's, that's exactly right. That's it in a nutshell. Yep. Simple as that. Simple as that. Wow. Yeah, it's just a matter of... I didn't mean to put words in your mouth. No, no, no. <laughs> you, you put better ones than I could. <laughs> but yeah, there's early adopters, right? Then it's so the people, it takes a bit longer and some people are drag their feet. That's just the nature of technology, mm. isn't it? So it, we're on yeah. that curve. Okay. You know, we're, on, we're well on our way up towards uh, acceptance of, amongst a, a larger proportion of the, of the training population. Five years from now, both of you, five years from now, ten years from now, how much, how improved will the technology be even beyond the point that we are now? And is it just going to keep going, getting better and better and better? Yeah, there's all kinds of potential going forward, particularly once we've collected large amounts of data and we can start applying AI techniques to that data. That's going to show all kinds of things, I think, going forward. And it won't be five or ten years if we're able to keep going. Uh, two years. Oh, wow. We've got some rudimentary AI working on it already. And uh, if things go really well, well, we'll have a lot of improvement just over the next two years, I think. And Denise, from your standpoint, from your uh, surgical expertise, uh, how do you see the forward curve going? Yeah, I think that this truly is going to the future um, in racing. I think that the more we can do to uh, know more about these horses whilst they're galloping, um, of course, the horse at a gallop is moving in such a way that it's not going to always show if it has aches and ailments while it's trotting on the blacktop. Um, and I just think more information is better for us as veterinarians, for the trainers. And I, I really think that this is going to be a, a very useful tool. I think technology has done nothing but improve you know, medicine in general. And that's what we need to look at this as. Put it in the same field as, you know, obviously digital radiographs, ultrasound. You know, MRI, nuclear scintigraphy, you, you go there, it's all, it's all advancements in, in, med in medicine. And in this case, it's going to be in, in veterinary medicine and training resources. This experiment, by the time this posts, will have run its course here in Kentucky. So where next, what next, and, and how soon do you think we can get this to grow and, and go yeah. beyond? So we're trying to, um, we're negotiating with Churchill now with a view to trying to carry on into the rest of the uh, Ellis uh, meeting. Uh, we've got a system up at Emerald Downs uh, already in operation um, and there's all kinds of interest so we're talking to a number of people uh, that are interested uh, in putting it on their tracks. So uh, it's, yeah, it's looking positive. I think uh, things will move forward. Oh, here's your, uh, now here's the, uh, this is the after, this is the saddle cloth that Denise has here that had the sensing device in it. And here's, let's take a look at it for if you're watching on YouTube. You want to hold that up here and the, uh, the actual sensing device. There's the saddle cloth and, and there it is. It looks like almost, a, you know, a thermostat control. Uh, again, it's in the palm of your hand. It's very light. And then it goes into, and this is the, the nerve center of this. Yeah. Now, this is our training set. Um, oh, there's bigger nerve centers, I imagine. There, there is, yes. This is the training set, so it's a little bit different to the racing set. So there's a laptop, and then there's a, a whole kit of what looks like a big suitcase full of, uh, yeah. you know, phone chargers is yeah, almost what it looks like. Exactly. So, like I said, this is just the training set, so we just pop it into this dock over here. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and then just, up will pop yeah, a bunch pop, of dots and lines. And it, it'll pop up there in a second. And so that, that's downloading through that wire into here. Yeah. Okay, so just your basic uh, USB umbilical yeah. type of a thing uh, into the laptop, and this is your basic standard issue laptop. Okay. And uh, up it will come. Oh, that's the that's GPS stuff that you know, it's been picking up where the horse is all the time. Oh, that, I see. That's, uh, yeah, that's a, the GPS. That, that's from a different one, yeah. Oh, that's a different a different yeah, program. That, okay. Yeah, this guy, that was. Well, there's a GPS in there that's uh, 
this tenning is where the horse is on the track. Oh, I see. Okay, so it's and not completely the, without GPS in no, some way, shape, or form. No, GPS tenning is where the horse is and, and helping us with the uh, speed calculation. Distance, etc. Like mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. And then there's all the accelerometer data, which is then synced up with the GPS uh, signal. That'll take about two minutes. Okay. <laughs> The world, but yes, the, the racing set basically uh, kind of a similar setup box like this where when the sensors come back, we just pop them in and they all download automatically, so it's not um, okay, it's, it's a little with bit their names and uh, yeah, mm -hmm. etc. Is this uh, here yeah. comes a uh, exactly here comes so, some your basic sort of readings that this is just showing us this horse's movements around the track. Um, the horse's name was uh, uh Tisbo 21. Tisbo, mm -hmm. okay. yeah, so just a two year old out today. Um, that's just basically showing us as this was tracked around the track, and uh, it's in multiple colors. Does that indicate speed, or is that uh, just uh, arbitrarily for just the sections? Yeah, just the sections on the track. Okay, yeah, exactly. So that's just us coming out from over here, of course, from Dale's barn. Oh, I see. Okay, yeah. so, so the darker mm -hmm. the darker lines are on the back side, yeah. and uh, and then on and then go the wrong way and then the right way and then finish the work okay yeah so we won't have the graph right here on this to show this horse's strides and uh, right now more than happy to show you some other ones oh that'd be fine sure yeah. okay okay so just to uh, get a look at uh, yeah, i'll just i'll just grab this one here there's one so this all um, <clears throat> we can generate some data in this and then some of it um zooms up to the cloud and then we can analyze it at home or in different places there's a, another vet in sweden who's done a lot of the developmental work of this so he'll be picking up these dat files from the from the cloud and developing uh, some of the reports okay excellent yeah so so I was trying to zoom in on this right here. That's one stride on the left. That's this, one this stride. This is an example of one stride. Wow. Um, on a group one, group two winner, comfortable horse. So kind of the first 40% or so of this. That's going to be the hind limb stance. This is going to be the front limb stance and the airborne phase. So that's just an example of one stride um, that was developed using several hundred, uh, you know, group one, group two winners. So that is what we constitute as the fingerprint of okay. um, what that's they're stretched the like. And, and, and so if you mm -hmm. see a real big deviation from that yeah, somewhere, so that's almost like a seismograph going on. Exactly. Okay. So if you look at this one down here, this is a stride pattern developed from looking at, you know, several hundred uh, $10,000 claimer horses. So a bit of a lesser quality, slightly different signal, but still resembles a stride. Um, and then if we look at this one on the bottom, this is a horse who um, actually broke down in his piece of work after this race. So, you know, it doesn't even really closely resemble the ones above. Um, this horse raced and got a red flag and uh, in his next piece of work he unfortunately had a catastrophic injury. So. Um, so again, with a C graph, it just seems like here, there's yeah. a lot more up and down wiggly mm -hmm. lines as Absolutely. opposed to something a little more stable on the A yeah. and B. Exactly. And that would have been an alarm bell had, yeah. had you seen it beforehand. Yeah, well, it, you know, that's it. If you get a red flag, and this is a stride pattern that we see, um, it's a good reason to go all over your horse, have a real good look at him. Again, like I said, it's not always going to show up when you're jogging these horses on the blacktop. So that's where this technology really comes in. But, you know, for me as a vet, if I'm getting told I've got a red flag, and if I'm interpreting this and reading it, um, I'd be going over that horse from head to toe. And um, Wow. Yeah, exactly. That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. And and it's only and it's only going to get better, isn't it? I mean it's only as as complicated as mm -hmm. this looks. We can look at this again like you guys were saying, in two mm -hmm. years this yeah. will look like the movable type era. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so again, you know, the more follow up we get, the more we can see um, what we're associating with these different stride patterns. There can be certain variations that won't flag as a red flag. Um, and they have value to us too, but right now it's like I said, a screening test of the red flag and the more follow-up we get, the more we'll know and the more we can help everybody. That's amazing, yeah. that's amazing. Yeah. Wow, very good. Oh, and this, and, and you have a thing called the fingerprint concept. Yeah, so that's, that's like I said, that, that A right there was our idea of a fingerprint. So again. <laughs> you all right? Yeah, we're just taking a look at, um, we want to show them some stride patterns, and I said we'll show this one. Yeah. So, um, like we show the fingerprint concept, that horse back here in A, that's what we say is like, it's a perfect fingerprint for a perfect stride. Um, this data here is the first 10 strides of um, a two-year-old colt in his first race. And everything here, that all looks pretty normal. Uh, you know, that would have been a green flag. Um, and then this horse went out and raced again, and this horse, you know, had a breeze again. 
and this is his third race. This is the next time we got sensor data on this horse. And as you can see, it's far more erratic. Um, those peaks are far higher and narrower. Um, this is a horse in trouble. And unfortunately, this horse did break down during this race. And again, though, Can I put something yeah. in on? Yeah, please do, David. Because this relates to what we were talking about the other day. Mm -hmm. You know, that um, in that news report or that press release that got misinterpreted, mm -hmm. um, I felt I think this is a very optimistic thing for the industry in the future. Because here's a horse, he, we got him sound then, he went and ran somewhere else, breezed twice, so we didn't have him there and showed up at the track again here. And the moment he comes out of the gate, you can tell the horse is in trouble. Like that stride is not right, that's not right, that's not right. Again, the peaks and valleys on the graph are yeah, far, at, far more, far, far, again, looking yeah. like a, an, a seismograph in an earthquake. Right. Yeah. So that horse, my argument would be, if he's wrong coming out of the gate, he must have been wrong going into the gate. That means there was an opportunity there to have found him sooner. But if we could have got him and seen that in a breeze, then he would have got a red flag and we could have been all over him. As it was, we didn't. And he went off like that throughout the race and it was 70 seconds later uh, that horse broke a cannon wow. and, and was euthanized. So that's what I was getting to of the ones that happened at Churchill. Seven of the eight were like this coming out of the gate. So they'd come to us like that. Right. Right. And so it was nothing to do with with Churchill track or, or the circumstances that day. This had been going on for a long time. That was just happened to be where they went right. down. Right. Right. So uh, there's an analogy to that I'll use. If you had a piece of wire and you started bending it, you know, if you bend it enough, it mm -hmm. breaks. So imagine you get up in the morning, you're having your breakfast, you do the first couple of bends. You get in the car, you drive to work, you're bending in the car. So you go out to a restaurant for your lunch and you're still bending. And you go to the mall in the afternoon to buy a new shirt and halfway through buying the shirt, the, the wire snaps. Right? Well, if you start looking all around to blame the shirts for your wire snapping, you're not going to get the right answer. It was started when you were having your breakfast. Right, so right. it's the same with these things. That's what's happening with these bones. So the fact that it's happening much earlier in the future is the optimistic thing because now we've got the technology to see when it's there, and flag these animals that are beginning right. the trouble mm -hmm. and get them to the imaging and to the vets and diagnose them and protect them. So that, that was the point I was trying to got make it. in that thing. Guys, here's some bright news. Here's some positive right. news. Here's a way to solve it. You're getting data right off the horse's body that you've never had before. Right. And 2,400 times every second. You know, this is great. We're going to be able to crack this. That was the argument, anyhow. Mm -hmm. What's the cost factor? Sorry? The cost factor. Uh, how much is this going to cost? If, if like, ideally, yeah, this would be on every horse right. in the world. Yeah. Right. right. Oh, so what? Yeah. What's the cost factor going to be to make this happen? I mean, we, and will it get? Will it be lower as we go through time, and yeah. it becomes more of a volume? Yeah, thirty-five dollars per horse. Per, per horse. horse. Okay. And the initial I mean, investment for a track for the whole system would be well, that'd be very, that varies, according right? To what they're going to do, we we usually just charge for the tests, and that includes everything. You know, all the people, the equipment, everything we have to do is, it, is caught up in that and our analysis and assessment afterwards. So it's, it's, it's very, very, very inexpensive um, to save a horse's life and a jockey from being paralyzed. Yeah, very good. Yeah. Well, David and Denise, thank you so much for all for the generosity of your time and all the information. Thank right. you for your time on the Ron Flatter Racing Pod. Thank you. We'll finish up with Dale Romans on the back end of all this. So, routine training day, but the routine has changed here this spring for you with the advent of this technology. It really doesn't change what you do much, but it just gives you a lot more information, doesn't it? It does. It's a tool. You know, just like x-rays came around, or scoping, or ultrasounds that the veterinarians can use. This is another tool that we put into play. And it really doesn't affect me unless we get a bad read on a signal. I never hear anything unless it's a, what they call a red flag, and uh, it's a horse that we need to look at a little bit harder. And uh, we've had a, a few red flags, not a bunch, but out of the ones we've had, we, you know, you find a little something maybe that you just had to tweak, and they were firing. We found one though that we really think that we might have saved a life on. He had a very small hairline and a cannonbone starting. It could have been a conjular, and uh, instead of conjular and being catastrophic or Needing surgery and being off for six months, so he's off 60 days and he'll be right back in action. So I think the technology has a way to go. 
it uh, you know we, we, we're not ready to live and die by it but I think it's a step in, in the right direction and it, it's, it's exciting stuff and it just seems to be getting better and better better to have the information available than not to though right uh, yeah it's always better to have information and all the information is doing is telling you to look a little bit harder and uh, it's telling you something that, that you're going to see in three weeks anyway. It's telling you three weeks earlier. And early detection for anything is key. What's the message you would have for trainers who are reluctant to embrace the technology? Don't be intimidated by it. It's never going to replace horsemanship. It'll it enhance the horsemanship. And, uh, you know, it's it's not going to be something that anywhere soon anyway that's going to disqualify a horse from being able to race or train. But it's a tool to use, and, and, and I, I, people I think are afraid it's going to take horses out of the barn. You're going to see a red flags, and you need to stop on them. You're going to take them out of my barn. What you're really going to do is leave them in the barn because they might be out for a short period of time, but if you don't use the technology down the road, maybe they're going to be out for a long period of time. As far as, as you said, the technology is only going to improve. We've seen that certainly in other walks of life. And so uh, how optimistic are you that this can be a game changer for this sport? I, I think at the end of the day, it could be huge. I think that, I think that we need, what we need to do is figure out, we're still learning to interpret the data. And uh, once you get enough horses in the system and you, you can even use artificial intelligence to read the data and predict where you're going, I think that it could definitely be a game changer. Do you understand the reluctance of uh, trainers who are saying, ah, I don't know? Yeah, yeah, I understand it. It's intimidating at times to be, uh, you know, to, to embrace something new. You've been doing it your way for a, for a very long time. But it doesn't change the way we do anything. It just gives the guy a little information earlier than he would have gotten it and makes it easier for him to fix. So it's really going to make our job easier, in my opinion. Do you, uh, do you hope that the mainstream media who are not like racing media, like folks like me, are going to pay attention to this? Because right now we are we're out of the Triple Crown season. And a lot of folks won't pay attention again until next year's Derby. It would be nice if they paid attention to this, though, right? I mean, I don't know. I don't know what we do to get that message through. Well, we're doing it right now. True. And, uh, but yeah, I think that in today's environment, we've had a lot of problems on the racetrack. As it's well documented, I think that this shows people that we are working hard to try to make this as safe for an animal when they go out there to run as possible. And uh, th I think this is a, the biggest step we've taken in a long time. And like I say, it's still down the road to technology, but I want everybody out there to realize that the horse industry wants to protect these horses. And this is one way to do it. But we just gotta keep looking for things that make the make race horses' jobs as easy as possible. I also see one other thing here that could be a benefit. It seems like some folks who are on either side of the regulatory issues in horse racing right now are coming together on this project. Yeah, I haven't seen it. There, there's been so once you sit down and explain it to someone, it doesn't seem quite as intimidating. Right. Everybody seems to get on board. It doesn't matter what side, if you're pro his or anti his or pro medication, anti it doesn't matter. This is something totally different. Right. There's no reason that we all shouldn't rally behind and, and embrace any technology. Like I say, it's, it's still down the road before it's going to be perfected, but at least we're trying something and we're working in a good direction. We've got a lot of smart people working on this project. Very good. Dale Romans, thanks for inviting us over here to do this. I'm glad you mentioned it last month, and here we are. Got Thank it done you. here on the Rock Thank Flatter Racing Fund. My thanks again to Dale Romans, David Lambert, Denise McSweeney as well. And so we've introduced you to Stride Safe. Where it goes from here remains to be seen, but there is a lot of upbeat thought that this technology can be useful. How useful, how it's applied, these are things that still have to be worked out in the days and weeks and months and years ahead. But hopefully, this is one way that horse racing can improve what has been a 14-year trend for fewer deaths on the racetrack and maybe trend it even further in the right direction. From Churchill Downs, I'm Ron Flatter. Thanks for joining me on the Ron Flatter Racing Pod via Horse Racing Nation.